Yeah, dear colleagues, so welcome to our final seminar of our seminar series on the social role of colleges across the globe. This is the 12th and final seminar in this series. I first wish to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the land, traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. And today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And we, as researchers from the U of T, are very grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. And this uh, seminar series is organized by Professor Lisa Wielehan, Professor Gavin Moody, and myself, Jakob Kost, with the support of the Center for the Study of Canadian and International Higher Education at OISI of the University of Toronto. Special thanks to the graduate assistants, Siang Li, Erin Anderson, and Ahmed Su for their support in organizing this series. This series explores the important role that community colleges and similar type of institutions play in supporting social, education, and cultural development across communities and regions. And we argue that the role um, that colleges play is not as well understood or theorized as the role of universities or schools, and that this matters because colleges are vital for the well-being of their local communities. They support their regions, the communities, and many often invisible ways. And however, the ways in which they do so different in different countries and systems, and that's uh, why the speaker series includes speakers from very different countries. Until now, um, the speaker series featured great presentations uh, on developments, oh, sorry, on developments in the college sector in Canada, in France, in Switzerland, in Finland, the United States, Germany, the UK, Chile, Australia, Brazil, and Ireland. And you can access all these um, previous presentations and recordings uh, of them on our website. And uh, Aaron posted the link already to our YouTube channel as well. We are very happy to close the series with a talk from our today's speaker, Professor Gavin Moody, with a progress report on the social role of colleges. Gavin is an adjunct professor in the Department of Leadership, Higher and Adult Education at the University of Toronto at OISI. And he has published over 50 journal articles, book chapters, and encyclopedia entries on tertiary education policy, particularly the relation between vocational uh, and higher education. And this is the subject of his book with the title From Vocational to Higher Education on International Perspective. His most recent book is Universities, Disruptive Technologies, and Commun Continuity in Higher Education, the Impact of Information Revolutions. Gavin is uh, currently researching the relations between college and university education and work. And I had the chance of doing research and teaching classes with Gavin over the last two years. And I feel very privileged that I had the opportunity to work with and learn from him in, uh, during this period. So before we start, a quick reminder, if you have any questions during the talk, please post them in the chat. And uh, Gavin is happy to answer them after his talk. So without further ado, um, Gavin, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, uh, Jacob. I uh, ah, here we go. Perfect. I just learned just learned um, uh, this, and I learned it from YouTube. So not good learning. Far better to have experiential learning than learning from MOOCs or purely online. So uh, this is uh, a, a good illustration of trying to learn without the help of an expert teacher. Well, it's been uh, very challenging, but uh, but interesting trying to pull together some 
ideas from our thinking and seminar series so far. So I'm calling it uh, spinning a yarn. It's this is I don't know I don't know whether it's true in other um, language traditions, but in Australia it means telling a story and possibly an improbable story, one that is not entirely true. And we have here to accompany us on this story, Portia, which is Lisa's cat. And here we can see Portia helping uh, Lisa with her crocheting. And like all cats, uh, Portia likes chasing threads and she will chase the threads through our, um, our presentation this afternoon. Here's uh, what is the way I've structured the presentation. There are 52 slides and I'm not going to go through every single one of them. So um, I'll be picking and choosing as we go, depending on how time goes. Um, the two theoretical contributions, or the two references to theory, are the institutionalization of organizations and the construction of the social role. So first, the knitters and the knitting. Here are the people who have contributed to the project team, Jakob, Lisa, and me, and then our um, research assistants, both current and previous. And uh, we're very grateful for the contributions and support of research assistants. The um, seminar series, uh, comprise these seminars and they form the uh, material from which I construct this uh, summary. They're all up on the website that Aaron put a, a link to. So here's um, the URL and there's the a screenshot of Gallus' presentation, both um, his slides and um, the uh, video of his presentation. The slides for this presentation, I think, are already up on the website, as is the background paper of uh, 20 or 30 pages. Um, following this, some of us are presenting a double symposium at the European Conference for Educational Research in Glasgow in late August. And we're also um, about to invite abstracts for a special issue of the Journal of Vocational Education and Training uh, 500 words due on the 2nd of October, and there's a stage process from turning those um, submissions into paper proposals into full submissions to the journal. We are contemplating further development of our work, but that's as far as we've got thus far. Right, so the first um, reference to theory is on the institutionalization of organizations. So here's a whole bunch of organizations, uh, pictures of universities. So this is um, Peking University established in 1898. Uh, Ahmed, can you tell us about this middle university here? 
Uh, yeah, sure. It is. Uh, it is in Istanbul. It is uh, like a, a historical kind of gate. To be honest, I haven't been there, but I am familiar with the picture. It is. Uh, it is in Istanbul University. And uh, some date uh, uh, date back. Some say that the the foundation of the university dates back to like fourteen hundreds. Uh, so uh, yeah, like it is a historical place, and the university is still like uh, going on uh, like research and teaching activities now. So it is it is a, a good one in uh, beautiful uh, It is a good one in beautiful Istanbul. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Glad. And this one here is the uh, uh, Indian Management Institute of Management Education in Kolkata. And these uh, organizations, these universities are of very different nature, reflected in their very different architecture. And yet, they have been uh, transformed inst institutions in the sense of a collection of shared norms and expectations about what a university might be and what might be appropriate for a university to do. And those, that institutionalization, that shift from organizations of very different natures into one idea of a university is in our tradition, I suggest, due to the work of three people and many, many others. So this is uh, John Henry Newman. This is a, um, a sculpture of him when he was cardinal. But since then, he was canonized in um, 1999. So if we're giving him a title, we're calling him Saint Newman. And this is a University College Dublin. This is the original building of the Catholic University of Ireland, which um, Newman established and for which his essays, The Idea of the University, was it a description or a uh, theorization of, but that university uh, did not succeed. It failed after 20 years, and the building uh, is now part of University College Dublin. And this here down the bottom is Oriel College, where um, Newman was master and fellow for many, many years. Here is um, Wilhelm Humboldt, statued outside the university under Linden. Beautiful um, uh, university name for him in Berlin, in the meter, in the central of meter. And here's a, um, a picture of um, uh, the main building that fronts the main street and here is uh, University of Göttingen, a um, recent um, university, uh, a recent building uh, which um, von Humboldt uh, stayed at for a few terms but didn't graduate from, didn't graduate from any university. And here's uh, Clark Kerr who developed the idea of the multi-university here is um, the president's building from where he developed the idea. And here is Stanford, um, where he was a long time professor. Now, note that this apparently unified idea of a university comes at the expense of a raising or suppressing different national traditions. We don't look closely at um, traditions beyond Christian um, 
Anglo US European. We erase the Confucian tradition of learning, the Islamic tradition of learning, and the Hindu tradition of learning to develop this unified theory of uh, the university. Nonetheless, it's very powerful and it is a, a, a makes a very great contribution to universities' continuity. And part of the institutionalization of the university is the expectation that they discharge three roles. Used to be the preservation, the transmission, and the extension of knowledge. But from at least 1961, the same pictures have been reorganized and re-expressed as teaching, research, and service. And those three roles are institutionalized in the same way that the idea of the university is institutionalized. The idea of these three roles uh, encompasses many, many, an uh, enormous diversity in what individual universities as organizations do and how they go about doing it. Nonetheless, we're quite comfortable in kind of lumping them all as teaching, research, and service. And one way of understanding the project is to say that we want to institutionalize colleges in the same way. We want to develop the idea of the college in a way that's understood across different uh, jurisdictions and different contexts, notwithstanding that they are as variable or possibly more variable than universities as organizations. And we want to institutionalize three roles of colleges, which we argue they share with all post compulsory institutions, organizations, notwithstanding that the way those roles are discharged differs markedly and the emphasis that each organization gives to each role differs markedly between organizations, between programs, between lower level and upper level, between fields. And we do this by taking the current understanding of colleges roles, which is a miscellany, a whole hodgepodge, a whole mixture of different things. And categorizing them as fruit, vegetables, fruit salad and vegetable salad. By, by aggregating these different activities within higher organizing principles, higher categories, we hope to encompass the ideal roles of the college as we encompass the ideal roles of the university. And these three roles we identify following our colleague and friend, the late Jim Gallagher, as educational, occupational, and social. We can express them in different ways. Here we've um, put them in a very strong way, but we could, we could modify the language somewhat. But a college's educational role, we argue, is not just to educate the students for their current program, but to prepare them to advance to further education or higher levels of education. That is, in our understanding, no college's educational program is terminal in that dreadful expression common in the USA. 
and we express that here, but you could, but, but you could express it in, in different ways. So education, work and society, which colleges and universities do differently, both between themselves and between different types of colleges, and you give different emphases depending on the type of program you're offering. That's um, the core argument. So let's pick up some threads. Here, um, I look at just one simple table. I know it's reductive from education at a glance, looking at adults highest educational attainment below tertiary, post-secondary non-tertiary, short cycle tertiary, uh, programs of two years duration, typically bachelors and masters above. And we note that Australia, Canada and Ireland have low proportions of their adults whose highest qualification is below tertiary. And that is because they have relatively higher proportion of their adults with post-secondary non-tertiary and sh short cycle tertiary. That is the contribution of colleges to educating the population, to educating society. In contrast, Look at Germany, 56% of the adult population has its highest qualification below tertiary. This is accurate in one sense, but unfair to Germany, because in this classification and in most understandings, apprenticeships are below tertiary. And so this is not including any of Germany's very strong apprenticeship system. It, it is a, a, a characteristic of the way uh, sectors are defined and statistics are collected, which I come back to second last slide. And so um, uh, this is a really quick summary of um, uh, the arguments put in each of our seminars. And I won't uh, go through each one because it'll get too uh, complicated, but I, I later, um, refer to this diagram, which I present here. So this is from Skolnick's work. He describes US higher education as the vertical system where we have a college sector, which I have uh, shown as a blue box, which feeds into the university system which I've shown here as a blue triangle, a triangle because there's a strong hierarchy amongst universities, whereas colleges, they are less hierarchical, but they're all blue because in this tradition, colleges present lower level university or academic work. They are offer the associate degree in arts and sciences, which is the first two years of a four year degree offered by university. In contrast to the USA vertical system, we have, according to Skolnick, the parallel system of continental Europe, where the universities are similar uh, because they've been institutionalized to offer academic and hierarchical, but they have another parallel system 
of vocational education. It's read because it's associated with work and it is not, it's in a parallel relation to universities because this vocational sector offers as a standard uh, qualification, bachelors, but also masters, parallel system. And his argument was that Ontario colleges were established initially, not uh, consciously, but initially on the parallel system, but because of the strength, the power of the US example, they've been pushed towards the vertical system and so they're struck in between. So let's um, knit these um, threads together to make one observation about the structure of sectors and another observation about universities' social role, which has been variously described as a civic role, as a third mission, as Boyer's um, scholarship of engagement, of the Carnegie Commission's cate voluntary categorization of institutions by community engagement. Let's see what that might mean for colleges. So on sectors, here's, this is very crude, it's reductive and we can see um, inaccuracies with it, flaws with it, but I use it to make one point. So we have UK's further education sector uh, responsible for upper secondary, A level and certificates, post-secondary non-tertiary and short cycle tertiary uh, foundation degrees. We have the USA, uh, colleges, community colleges responsible for post-secondary non-tertiary certificates and short cycle tertiary diplomas and associate degrees. And at least as it's presented to us, we have the German system, the Deutsche system, as universities of applied science those were the colleges that were presented to us by Dr. Anand, which offer baccalaureates and masters. And we have Ireland, which, um, which Gareth uh, interrogated a bit, and it is quizzical. Mind you, it's a small jurisdiction and they're going through various changes, but Ireland seems to have two sorts of colleges at least on uh, this presentation, further education and training colleges, which offer lower level uh, qualifications and um, uh, 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 universities of technology, which offer some diplomas, but mostly bachelors and masters. Now that was in the initial understanding but we've seen development since then. So the UK has some colleges with so-called degree awarding powers, not huge proportion of their students doing baccalaureates, but, but an accepted role. Same with the USA, about half the USA states now have colleges which offer baccalaureates. And Remember that Germany isn't reporting any contribution of its apprenticeship dual system as tertiary vocational education because it is not of tertiary level, but nonetheless, it is very strong. There's a very strong um, uh, contribution of Berufsschulen. And so, not meant to be there, but I wonder whether we might 
sneak them in there without telling the statisticians. And likewise, as uh, Gareth was uh, asking a couple of weeks ago, what's Ireland going to do about, as it were, the missing metal? And would there be opportunities for further agitation and training colleges to offer uh, more high level programs? Or might they have closer association with universities of technology? I, I, and the response was, well, we've only just restructured our system and it's only going through its development stage, so we don't know. So that leads me to wonder whether Anglophones are moving more to a parallel arrangement of the sectors so that we may expect our vocational colleges either to offer more and more baccalaureate and I would hope at least for the colleges I know in Canada and Australia applied masters and might uh, those um, jurisdictions such as Finland, Germany, G Germanic speaking countries articulate a place for vocational colleges at the lower end of tertiary. So that, that'd be the first issue. And the second issue is, is there a way we can um, generalize across um, the many examples of colleges' social roles that we heard in our speaker series and that we see in the literature? So I think just about everybody acknowledges that colleges have a role in equity, by which we mean providing opportunities for disadvantaged people, for communities underserved by um, the non-vocational sector. Even the analysts who argue that colleges should stick to their knitting of university transfer or of vocational preparation, occupational preparation, will accept that colleges have an equity role in preparing disadvantaged students for transfer to baccalaureate or in preparing disadvantaged students for work, but they would incorporate it within their core function. Well, I suggest we can take that out and have it as a foundation for college's social role. And then we have several, several um, different examples which I elaborate in the paper, and I won't go too much uh, depth here, of colleges' so, social role. So service learning, stronger, I think, in US universities, but it, but it certainly exists in many, many colleges. That is where we have, as one of our class projects, working with a community group or uh, working with a underserved community. Um, we have education extension services by which I mean uh, educational services which are open to the public either explicitly to bring people into formal education or simply as a way of transmitting knowledge to the general public. We have cultural enrichment through um, exhibitions, uh, performances, many of which are made available uh, to the public. 
We have uh, work extension services by which I'm referring to seeking to develop uh, people's ability to obtain and uh, hold down a job through various uh, standard techniques, writing a CV, importance of um, fitting in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we have various contributions that the college make to community development and engagement and local and regional uh, development, which um, Shula, Barron and Field describe generally as developing social capital. Lisa likes this role broadly, social networks, the reciprocities that arise from them and the value of these for achieving mutual goals. So uh, a lot of that community work we're describing in modern parlance as developing social capital. So I think we can um, put these roles in a matrix. Some we do on campus, some we do off campus. And indeed the whole idea of the modern college is that the boundaries between campus and off campus are blurred. And some of them are individual. We present these equity programs for individual uh, disadvantaged people, but also collective. We offer uh, literacy programs for refugees and new migrants. So both individual collective, and I think we can um, uh, argue that college's social roles fit into this matrix. Right, so um, Portia is coming to the end of her um, crocheting and we end with uh, the questions that Lisa posed early on in the project, which um, perhaps we should address in subsequent phases of the project. So there's our uh, quilt sewn together as a patchwork, which perhaps we might reformulate in a different pattern. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to your uh, contributions. Thank you very much, Kevin. That was a wonderful presentation and also for me a new perspective on the social roles, especially with regard to these uh, matrix of individual versus collective on campus versus off campus. But we, um, before I get into it, um, probably start uh, with a discussion and, uh, and Charles, do you wanna uh, open your mic and ask your question? Oh, uh, good morning. Thanks for taking my question. It, it, uh, I was a little late joining. So if I'm uh, um, replicating something that's already been discussed, please forgive me for it. But I, I found it fascinating that Gavin uh, re-emphasized, and I think it's so important to talk about what are the roles of the colleges. And I'm coming from an Ontario college perspective. So I'm gaining that. I have worked in, in the college system in the UK as well. So I have got some knowledge from that. But one of the things that we have noticed at the Ontario colleges and mine in particular, um, especially over the last uh, number of years, is the number of international students that we have and from all over the world, amazing, amazing people. Now this country historically has had uh, difficulties with uh, newcomers to the country sort of integrating. So we've heard for many years, um, well, you haven't got Canadian experience or you haven't got, uh, uh, well, your credential has come from elsewhere and it's not recognized. So that's always been a problem. But it seems to me that we're on sort of the, 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 the emergence of, of, of something new that we haven't seen in the colleges before. And that is that we're seeing fewer domestic students and the number of international students from all around the world outweigh the numbers of domestic students. 
So are we adding a fourth role? Is it indicating a shift or are we adding a fourth role as a port of entry, uh, a means by which we can assist people in not just acculturating to the country, but also integrating and becoming successful in their careers? So I wondered whether that was something that we should consider as a, as a, a, as a new role, port of entry, I, I call it for want of a better word at this stage. Yes, thank you very much, Anne. Um, the uh, Canadian colleges and particular Ontario colleges have increased their enrollment of international students spectacularly. It is, it is a wonderful hold. And I haven't looked at the figures, but from the countries I know, uh, Ontario in particular, but also the other colleges barring Quebec, outperform by miles USA, Australia, the UK. They're, they're, just, they're very, very strong in international, in recruiting international students. And many analysts coming from the university tradition misread this as if it were international students taking diplomas or advanced diplomas or foundation degrees or associate degrees. Yes, of course, many international students do that, but I, I should look at the figures, but vast numbers of international students are taking post-graduation certificates. I'm not telling you anything new, <laughs> and but I, for the benefit of our audience, they're taking post-graduation certificates and post-graduation diplomas. So these international students are already graduates in their home country, and they're taking a program which uh, incorporates them within Canadian educational and occupational systems, because an important part of Ontario's college's graduate, postgraduate certificates and postgraduate diplomas is a core time of work integrated learning, where the student is in a workplace negotiated with the support of the college, et cetera, et cetera. So work integrated learning. And um, that, I agree with you, is a terribly important role for many, many reasons. There is a debate um, about international, about Canada's under recognition of uh, qualifications obtained from abroad. Now, I read stuff that says Canada's worse than Australia. I, I'm not so sure it is because Australia does a very poor job of recognizing qualifications from abroad. Um, and there's, so, so, so what do we do about that? How do we improve it? And there are many thoughts and things, but I think the data shows that Ontario colleges, post-graduation certificates and post-graduation diplomas are very successful at integrating international students within uh, Canada's edu formal education system and work system. And I think that's, that's a, um, a, a very great service. And so I would seek to re-express um, colleges, international education in those terms as you have done so. And I think that changes the discussion from the one that we're incorporating from the university side, which is, um, not as helpful, and I don't think it reflects the very distinctive contribution that Ontario colleges make. So that's a very 
interesting and useful point. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Charles. Thank you, uh, Lisa, next. Um, so this is just a little bit of thinking out loud here in terms of our efforts to try and theorize the role of colleges. Um, and just for the benefit of um, participants, um, a lot of this work has its origins uh, in, in our work before Gavin and I even came to Canada uh, in Australia and um, largely trying to seek to um, develop an alternative to the deinstitutionalization of uh, technical and further education institutes or TAFE institutes that was occurring in Australia as a result of marketization and privatization um, in that sector and which has basically decimated TAFE um, in that country. And we use the notion um, of anchor institutions as a way of trying to theorize what colleges do that universities don't do um, and as a way of, of articulating to policymakers what the role of TAFE was. Um, now, I'm just wondering, Gavin, whether you think that that notion of anchor institutions is not particularly helpful um, or if it doesn't sufficiently differentiate TAFE, say, from um, more regional uh, and newer universities, which also claim to play that role. That's that's one point. Um, the, the, the other the other question, I wonder when we ask the question, what can colleges do that universities and schools can't do? Well, if we focus on what can colleges do that universities can't do. And to me, uh, the, the role of um, that, because colleges more directly prepare uh, students for direct range of occupations, they have a much closer connection with the nature of work. Um, and what happens in, you know, in, in terms of people's jobs and what they do in their jobs. And is one of the roles that colleges play that they can actually research how work is changing in res uh, as a consequence of the broader changes that are happening and new insights, and therefore consider what work, you know, how, how credentials and curriculum should change in response to that. So the example that we often use is aged care workers are much, um, the teachers in colleges who teach aged care workers are much closer to the practice of aged care than say people in universities who research Alzheimer's. Are teachers in colleges better placed to take the insights of the university research on Alzheimer's to consider what should that mean for what aged care workers should do? As, and I, it seems to me, I think that that's something that colleges can do more effectively than universities. So I'd just be interested in what you think about those two points. Yes, thank you very much for that. On anchor institutions, I think its salience depends upon the context. So in Australia, colleges as anchor institutions is terribly important because it's decidedly not a role served by the private for profits. It's a, it's a one way of saying, oh, well, it's not just a community service obligation, something completely different. And I think we saw um, uh, last time we were in England when we were doing some work for University College Union, a lot of the comrades were very worried about the amalgamation of colleges. So a college from one small town was being amalgamated with a college from another small town 15 mile away. And um, all of the core activities were concentrated in on just one site. And the comrades were very, very concerned about the role being lost to the uh, village or the small town without a strong college in there. And um, anchor institutions was one way of articulating that. Likewise, in Norway, I think, when there was amalgamation of a whole bunch of regional colleges, there was also concern. So I think that, so, so I think that would be important. And um, that it is, a role shared by 
um, universities with a, which have a regional orientation, I don't mind at all because I think we can be institutionalized in similar ways. And I think your second point is a very interesting extension of what colleges, at least in Canada, understand as their research and innovation role. So it's a little bit derivative of universities research extension services, whereas the uh, role that you describe is more distinctive of colleges. And because um, it's not just replicating what universities do, I think it provides a stronger justification for colleges applied research role, applied development role, and it's one that can be presented to uh, the community and to governments as a distinctive contribution of uh, colleges and one that universities I doubt would want to get involved with too much and so it, it really is a complement rather than just replicating in a smaller village. Thank you very much. Uh, we switch to Michael Skolnick's question about the way that data on colleges help to shape or misshape our view on colleges. Probably want to rephrase it, uh, Professor Skolnick. Or... Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> well, well <clears throat> excuse me. Well, first, I'd like to um, thank Gavin for such a thoughtful presentation. I'm looking forward to having more time to reflect on the slides you did show and to be able to see the ones you didn't. Some of them look very interesting in just the quick way you went past them. But over the past few years, I've been doing some research, international comparative research on colleges, uh, which has involved looking for data on colleges. And I've been struck by how limited the data is on colleges in just about all countries. And the fact that it reflects, I would say a, a university perspective and perhaps an out of date university's perspective, that the main contribution of colleges is producing graduates of a few long duration, relatively longer duration programs, diplomas, degrees, of course, when they produce degrees and some types of certificates. And I'm concerned about how this, on the one hand, reflects uh, uh, an erroneous view of colleges or a very limited view of colleges, and I'm even more concerned about how it might perpetuate or, or shape a view of colleges that for, causes us to look at just those, those major programs. Um, and I thought of that when I was looking at your slide 39, and uh, which showed some of the other activities of colleges, uh, important activities of colleges. And it seems to me that those activities are not beyond uh, uh, the capability to collect data related to them but we just don't do it. And so I, I just wonder what you think of the current state of data on colleges in terms of the view of colleges that it reflects and whether you think there is hope for, um, for improving, for broadening the kinds of data that we, that we collect on colleges and, and publish so that it could help uh, flesh out a broader, more, more rich view of what colleges do. Yes, thank you very much, um, Michael produced a series of fascinating papers comparing various aspects of colleges across jurisdictions. And uh, as he's written those, as he's prepared them, he has shared some of his frustration at getting comparable statistics. Um, even uh, even education at a glance does a violence but um, Michael went beyond that and he went to the domestic statistical collections for each jurisdiction he was interested in and they are very different from each other so you know as a diploma 
in uh, England the same as the diploma in Ontario, certainly not, Michael showed, is an applied degree in Ontario, similar to an applied degree in the USA. Well, and it's, uh, it's a very interesting uh, line of work. Um, and I think uh, the point you have been made has been made by our colleague, Dr. Dysinger from Germany, who is very annoyed at the way OECD statistics, not only education at a glance, but the various country reviews do not represent Germany's skill formation system appropriately. It, the, 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 the techniques of analysis of data collection and reporting that the OECD currently uses do not reflect well the enormously strong contribution of the um, duala system of apprentices in Germany and the other Germanic speaking countries. And I think that uh, apprenticeships is a very good example of exactly the point you're making because they're all apprentices. <laughs> the things in England that are called apprentices are apparently the things in Switzerland that are called apprenticeships, except that now England's got higher apprenticeships or degree apprenticeships. So what are they now? And um, likewise, one of the other conceptual and organizational tools we have qualification frameworks with uh, credits typically um, expressed ultimately in hours of class time is not reflecting at all what colleges are doing and what they're seeking to do. And the best we can do is a bit of hand waving about work integrated learning, but how does that get, well, work integrated, Hello, universities. You're rather late to the party, aren't you? So um, uh, I entirely agree. And I also agree that uh, we need new conceptual tools, new ways of expressing this. Um, the Carnegie Commission uh, tried, but I think we have to do more, and I think it's telling that of the 200 or so organizations which have gained voluntary recognition for their community's service role in the USA, only about a dozen or so are colleges. And I think that reflects kind of the university or the higher education orientation. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going over to Mary Wilson's question. Uh, Gavin, thanks so much uh, for this talk and thanks to OISE for hosting this series. It's been tremendous. Um, Gavin, I'm curious about the characterization of this vertical versus horizontal system structure and your thoughts around uh, sort of a move toward horizontal with I think some overlapping horizons of accountability across the post compulsory education systems globally. And I'm, I'm wondering, in addition to that, your thoughts around how that casts across disciplines, occupations and professions, because I see in the social mission of universities and colleges, a new muddiness or murkiness emerging around contributions to the professions, engineering, nursing, medicine, architecture, et cetera, and where, where colleges can meaningfully contribute to that work. And it seems like a bit of a silence right now in the literature and in our thinking. And I'm wondering if you've been thinking about it and, and what you might comment on sort of, I think we're clear about disciplines 
uh, and the accountability of universities. I think we're clear about occupations and that being the social mission of colleges, but professions seem uncertain to me. Is that a fair statement? Yes, well, thank you for an excellent point, but I don't see why the monkey should be grabbing the peanuts here, since we've got the author of this model, Professor Skolnick, online. So, uh, Michael, would you have any comments on the points made by uh, Mary? Uh, uh, thanks, Gavin. Uh, yeah, it occurs to me that um, in many ways, what, what college, some of the programs or, or some of the disciplines that Mary referred to, uh, we we would profit from using the term professional rather than vocational, as is used in uh, widely in Europe in the universities of applied sciences. Uh, that tends to give a I think that would tend to give a better perception of what colleges do. I mean, most people don't realize the level of, of complexity and sophistication and advanced knowledge that colleges are working with in many fields. And um, to treat all of, to use the term vocational as is common in Canada, to describe all the activities of colleges, that descriptor uh, is very misleading because there's such a diverse, diverse uh, set of activities there. So, I mean, one thing we, I think we, we could benefit from as, um, as I think Professor Charre uh, uh, proposed several years ago is, making greater use of the term professional to describe the, the activities of that sector it, it, where it's obviously appropriate. And it's an interesting question. We used to ask this sometimes of some version of this question on the, uh, on the comprehensive examinations uh, about whether it would make more sense for many college programs uh, to be combined with many university professional programs in some kind of uh, Institute of Professional Studies, rather than to be separated like they are and, and treated as, as very different worlds when really they have probably much more in common with each other than either do with many uh, with much of the activities in the institutions in which they're housed. Yes, absolutely. It's one of the ironies of our current arrangements that we get all of the Diploma of Applied Nursing students on one campus and talk about teamwork. And then we get all of the Bachelor of Professional Nursing students on another campus and talk about teamwork <laughs> separately. And um, especially in health, dentistry is a good example. The, it's a highly uh, structured and segregated area of expert practice. And yet they all work together in a team in the dental surgery but they're taught in vastly different locations in the uh, post-secondary education system. And the suggestion that dental assistants, that dental technicians, that dental therapists, that dental nurses, and the dentists even share a seminar is highly controversial and was opposed after a vigorous fight at the University of Adelaide, for example. And, um, I, and yet, as soon as they graduate, we want them to play nicely in this confined room where you're torturing the patient. So yes, it's a very uh, interesting point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have a bit further back in the chat, a question again by Anne Charles on uh, the role of quality assessment and accreditation. 
in the row. Sorry, I put my question in the chat. I didn't want to dominate the conversation here, but um, I just thought it, it, as we were talking about colleges, the, the, the uh, aspect of applied degrees and the external accreditation, particularly for PCAB, I think is worth uh, a mention and a conversation. And I know uh, among uh, colleagues, um, and I think Michael, um, you were uh, initially engaged in some of the conversations as well uh, with PCAB review of uh, applied degree um, uh, proposals. But uh, it, some people consider it to be sort of a, you know, a barrier, uh, some mechanism, but um, I think it's actually done the colleges an incredible favor uh, because it's really uh, encouraged them to make sure that not only do they continue to up their game, but the quality is externally recognized. And uh, the college that I work at, we have a number of our programs that are not just eligible for uh, professional accreditation, but also uh, status, uh, including uh, uh, professional engineers of Ontario, so for CEAB um, status. And when they come in to review, they ask uh, uh, a range of questions. And uh, I can certainly say the, um, the review conversations that I've been involved with, with ex these external um, agencies have sung our praises. And uh, I just wondered whether there were, it was any, uh, any uh, another aspect or a, 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 another viewpoint or uh, what are your views on it? Thank you. Yes, thanks very much. Again, Michael has written a very interesting paper on this. Michael. Well, thanks, Gavin. I, I'd, I'd be interested in your views on this too, but I mean, the, the downside of, a, of a, a common system of quality appraisal that applies to both uh, the, the universities and colleges is that it may fail to take into account the particular characteristics of, of, of colleges that they need to have in order to do uh, uh, the kind of applied degree programs that, that they're charged with doing. Uh, I, now I've looked into some of the aspects of this. For example, does it make more sense to have um, different quality appraisal bodies, one for college sector and one for university sector? Well, it so happens that that, that used to be quite frequent. There were several countries that had that, but over the past decade, there, there's been a movement, for example, New Zealand, Ireland, Denmark, uh, toward having a, a common framework. And then the, another way in which they were differentiated was by having different standards. And this still exists in some countries, uh, different uh, outcome standards for applied programs of, of the college or applied sector and the universities. For example, the Netherlands still has that. Um, in Ontario, we have we have the same body that does both colleges and universities, although not the not the public colleges, uh, but PQAB does both, as you know. And there's a common set of standards. Now, I think things have improved from what from everything I've been able to find out over the from the early years, when the college criticism that uh, they were the PQAB was inappropriately applying sta the standards of a research university to the applied, pro applied bachelor's degrees of colleges. But, but I think it has improved. And I think the way that it has improved is because the people who are doing the assessments and overseeing this have become sensitive to the distinctions. So even though it's the same people and it's the same standards, they have come to apply them in a more intelligent way that appreciates the differences between sectors, although that's still not without problems. But I think there's been great improvements because of that. Uh, but the, and that's that's a difficult thing to find in research, and, and it would be a difficult thing to measure. But it seems to me that this emphasizes the importance of, of uh, communication uh, between the uh, the people who are doing the assessments and the people who are being assessed. Um, and so I I, I think that uh, the worst is probably past us, but there there are still some improvements that could be made in that regard. And then just finally, got a comment about Anne's point. Uh, I remember when the standards were being developed in the PQAB back when it was first established in 200, the, the rationale for uh, applying the same, for adopting the same standards for the college bachelor's programs as for university programs was, well, this will, this will give more credibility to the college programs. But I, I think that it could easily not. 
and the colleges could end up with the worst of both worlds. They, their programs could still be looked down upon by the universities, but they could be forced to do things that would make their programs less effective, like not be able to hire the kind of faculty that have the professional experience that's necessary. So although I, I think there's maybe been some uh, gains there in credibility, I wouldn't overstate that. I think that as a paper that Lisa and Gavin uh, published uh, a year ago uh, argues, there's still a, 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 a strong hierarchy and uh, universities still do look down upon colleges and, and, and whatever, quali whatever quality review they go through isn't sufficient to uh, obviate the fact that they're still colleges, not universities. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, Lisa. I, I just want to continue on that point and actually ask Gareth his, his perspective on that issue too. I mean, uh, in Australia, we had exactly um, the, the situation that Michael outlined, um, where external accreditation um, of TAFE, of degrees offered by TAFE um, meant that the university standard, you know, the, the, the university model was imposed and I, um, on, on the college, on the, on the degrees that TAFE could offer. And I remember being particularly struck um, when uh, Holmes Glen TAFE offered a nursing degree. It was the first nursing degree offered by a TAFE. The nursing union held demonstrations out the front of parliament um, as a consequence and called for the sacking of the prime minister, um, you know, for implementing such an egregious um, action. And so the degree in the end that uh, Holmes Glen uh, offered looked pretty much like a university degree. At the same time, the University of Queensland turned around and um, re reworked their Bachelor of Nursing and their, their claim, their, their boast um, was that they had more work integrated learning in their nursing degree than any nursing degree in the country. Now, had Holmes led, Tate led with that, um, there's absolutely no way I think that they, they would have been accredited. But because a, an elite university, one of the group of um, eight elite universities in Australia was proclaiming it, you know, they could get away with it. You know, it was complete double standard. But I also remember when... Um, Gavin and I were getting into this work, reading Gareth's work, where and and where we learned in the UK that that was the same issue there. So I was just wondering if Gareth's got any thoughts on this. Hello, Gavin, and hello, Lisa, and everybody. And um, just to echo again what everyone has said about how splendid that was. Um, loads of lines. And threads of thought. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure I can say too much about accreditation and quality assurance in the let's call it the English model. The one thing I think is important is an historical development whereby under the binary system in England, and of course Australia got rid of its binary structure just before England decided to chuck it. Um, the body responsible for degree awarding, a national body, degree awarding in the non-university sector was one which was educationally intelligent. And it talked about curriculum. It talked about pedagogy and it talked about concepts of learning and relationships between theory and practice. So there was a, a socialization, if you like, of a deeper understanding of how to construct and think about a program of learning, which I think we see now continuing into the, if you like, the post-binary era where innovation is particularly strong in the newer universities. But at the same time, for colleges to get a look in is very difficult because the sector separations are still remarkably strong and the validating 
arrangements are top down, whereby colleges um, can propose, but universities collectively or individually um, can decide. So I, that's just a, an observation. But could, if I may, can I ask a question which is going back to um, that theoretical distinction or question about the institutionalization of organizations? I, I think that's really powerful question to ask because to make one obvious simple observation, aren't universities basically controlled and protected categories? In other words, the political economy of universities and their history is their ability to either get legal um, powers to keep anybody else out and away, and actually um, use that as a source of um, significant shaping of other people's higher education. So my question back to Gavin is, do we see any examples of where the concept of college carries any, in any jurisdiction, a controlled definition, let alone a legal one? And might it not feature in a discussion in the purposes of this project in terms of how might that in, <laughs> enable or actually undermine the purposes of building an idea of colleges? Well, thank you very much. Um, the new institutionalist theory people would say, oh, well, uh, legislation, legislative protection of the designation of university is just a particular uh, strong enforcement of the norm. But actually it goes, uh, I think we could take a more historical approach because since their emergence in the Middle Ages, universities, I mean, there was no category then, but they became known and they became accepted as those that were awarded a bull either from the Pope, Jus Dokiendi, or from the German Holy Roman Emperor, the right to award a certification to teach everywhere. So that legal protection is actually from the foundation of the, so we can't do that, but uh, a very interesting point. And I think we might get some help from our German colleagues because I suspect that the right to offer the on-campus part of an apprenticeship is regulated in the Germanic countries. So I, I, I imagine, I, I just, I expect, and um, and that might be a uh, first step, um, but it would be uh, it, it it's a very interesting thought. Thank you very much for that, Gareth. Can I just follow up on that? I think I, I think I think that's right. Um, so within the new institutionalist um, theory, you know, there's different camps, right? And um, I think the camp that Gavin, uh, Gavin was just talking about is a sociological new institutionalist. And then if we looked at the uh, historical new institutionalists like Streak and Fallon, they would argue that, um, that an organisation can be considered um, an institution to the extent that um, its, its uh, mandate is, is legally enforceable, you know, something along those lines. And I think, I think that's right. And what makes me think how can we think about that in terms of colleges um one of the key points that we would make in australia in response to the marketization privatization there was that 
the TAFE institutes are public institutions that fulfil public policy objectives, and that's their job. Um, you know, and so that that public mandate, I think, um, and public funding for that public mandate is one way that we can begin to think about carving off some space, perhaps, um, you know, for de protect, defining and protecting colleges um, in terms of the role that they play. I don't know. Yes, well, I think this is a new thought. We'll have yeah. to uh, think about that. Uh, yeah. Could I add so one thing? Sure. I'm sorry. The scale, the scale of service that colleges provide in society gives them a latent political power. I mean, they in most countries, colleges serve many more people than universities. And a good example, the Fachhochschule in Germany uh, fought to uh, get rid of the requirement in the early years that in their degrees, it say in parentheses, F -A, uh, FHS, after the after the degree title, uh, but the government just, uh, gave in to them and 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 removed that because there were so many people getting those degrees. There was such a a large mass of population that that had a, had an interest, and and so I think it's important for colleges to be aware of the of the latent political power they have because they're in they're in every house almost every household has some connection and and every business. So uh, they they can ex they can exert political power, which uh, is a countervailing force to the legal power that uh, that the universities have that, that Gavin pointed out. Uh, absolutely, I just uh, Gavin uh, probably um, one of the more final comments or or questions. Um, I really liked your uh, your matrix on the social roles distinction between on campus, off campus, uh, individual and, and collective engagement. Order. And I totally see that we could use that to describe colleges, profiles of colleges within a country, within a certain jurisdiction, across countries. Um, but we could use that as well in the exact same sense to describe the social role of a university or of uh, any other uh, post-secondary institution, right? So it's not really, or <laughs> that was just my, I was a bit puzzled whether you think this is more a way of generally describing the social roles that educational institutions play, and I would agree on that. and. Is it, is it uh, an instrument to describe the specific college-related social role? I wasn't too sure about that. So uh, probably you can help me a bit with that. Yeah, no, I, um, Lisa and I are arguing that all post-secondary organizations serve three roles. Uh, educational occupation and service. So this is not distinctive of colleges. But the way they do it, maybe the emphasis they have on occupation compared to education is distinctive. Also, um, um, the, all the discussion we've had so far has been an from a liberal market perspective and your presentation on Switzerland said well you gave us a very interesting slide uh, reporting the amount of time that academics spend in teaching research and service at different kinds of universities and service is tiny none of this 40 40 20 nonsense it's uh, 50%, 40%, 5% or something. I mean, it's just 7%. They're tiny, tiny, tiny. And one of the problems that you uh, uh, mentioned was that um, both universities of applied science and universities' roles, but particularly universities of applied science's roles, 
are part of the social settlement between uh, governments and institutions and society. And it really wasn't up to institutions, organizations to unilaterally change that. And I wonder therefore whether in coordinated market economies we need a different conversation rather than speaking to institutions, organizations, which have a lot of institutional autonomy, maybe we talk to the local community, maybe we talk to the canton, maybe we talk to the lander and say, well, you have got a college in your district and it is of course helping develop high level skills, but it's also all of these other things Perhaps you would like to notice that. Perhaps you would like to recognize that. Perhaps you would like to acknowledge that. Perhaps you would like to discuss with the social partners, the social roles of your university. And so we have the um, initiative coming not from the college, but from the social partner. That, that, that was my, so it yeah. might be constructed differently. Yeah, that might be a very interesting, interesting idea to do, to do that. Yeah, we're running out of time, slowly but surely. Uh, Lisa, any final comments? <laughs> You're muted. Today. Yeah, the, this is the last um, seminar in this series. It's been an absolutely wonderful series. We've heard from so many different countries and learned a lot. Um, and this, I think, provides an excellent foundation for continuing to develop this work in the future. And it's helped us think of new questions and new ways of, of, of thinking about things and helped us get outside the Anglophone liberal market ways of thinking a bit as well, which has been particularly um, helpful. So we have got other things coming up as, um, as Gavin outlined, uh, a special issue of um, Journal of Vocational Education and Training, um, a panel that we're organizing at the European Conference on Education Research, but also even in Ontario on the 1st of June, we've got a, a very big uh, a symposium which is going to feature uh, our community college leaders and uh, many of whom are graduates or alumni of our um, program. In fact, we have at least three alumni with us today, um, Mary, Laurel and Anne, and all of whom will be playing a role at this seminar and uh, symposium. And one of the things that we're trying to do with this symposium is to make more visible what colleges do and the role that colleges play. Um, and so the, um, Michael will be involved in the seminar uh, as, as will I. So we, we hope that this work continues. And I don't think we would have come up with the seminar or with the symposium without this seminar series to help us think through, you know, that uh, why this is so important. So just, just to finish, on behalf of uh, Jakob, Gavin and me, I want to thank all the presenters who have been part of the seminar series um, uh, that includes Gareth, who's here with us um, today, and, and Claudia, who's who's just left us. Um, and I want to uh, thank, in particular, our graduate assistants who've been put the whole thing together and have just been absolutely fabulous. So Akmek Su, Erin Anderson, Su Young Lee, and Yo, who's here, who's worked with us previously, Kelsey Lewis, and Mary Overholt. Without all of you, none of this would have happened. And it's been a fantastic seminar because of your excellent organization um, and skill in putting it all together and in promoting the thing. So thank you all and thank you to everyone. Okay, and that's it. It's a wrap folks, as they say. <laughs>